Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Just didn't want to unlock for some reason. All right. We are uh, in the life and teachings of Paul. We're down in 2 Corinthians. Remember uh, last week, we finally got Paul out of Ephesus, got him over to Macedonia and had to I mean, one verse, one verse, and we're right back into another letter. Praise the Lord. Um, and, and really, this is because Paul was having some issues with the church at Corinth, and uh, they wouldn't listen. Um, we, we, as we have said, there are probably, and I say probably, we're not going to teach this as doctrine, and if you don't agree with it or if you don't think it's actually that way, that's fine. There's no, you're not going to go to hell if you don't believe Paul wrote four letters to a church at Corinth. Uh, that's not the case. But um, we did want to say that um, we believe that in all likelihood that Paul wrote four letters to the church at Corinth, and um, they were going back and forth and, um, with those letters. Uh, first one, you know, probably dealt with some stuff. They kind of bucked at it. Paul came back in what we call First Corinthians and pretty, was pretty strong. Uh, throughout that letter, he's pretty strong. I mean, there's no, um, he didn't pull any punches, okay? And then in likelihood, there's probably a third letter, uh, one in between 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Then he gets back to the second, what we call 2nd Corinthians. And uh, it seems from, from a report that he received that they had somewhat uh, began to mellow on their position. And um, so Paul, Paul kind of, you know, said, look, you know, the guy that was in sin, Receiving back now because he's overwhelmed with much sorrow. I mean, he, pretty strong. Paul turned him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. So the spirit we saved him the day of the Lord, and he, he got to the point. And th then told the fellowship not to have any fellowship with him. Told the church not to have any fellowship with him. And um, there were some other things. And even Paul, and we'll, and we'll get into this. Uh, at the end of this letter, Paul does finish up with a defense of his authority. Okay. The last few chapters of 2 Corinthians, after the next two we're about to cover, he does give a defense of his authority and pretty strongly. Uh, and basically saying those other people who keep coming in there, are they're not there because they love them. They're there for other reasons. All right. So but last week we finished up the end of chapter 7. And as we said, Paul had, you know, he had, he had talked about uh, several things here in, in the uh, first part. And, he, you know, the reason that he did what he did um, different things, and, you know, he got to the end of chapter 7. Then he, he kicks over in chapters 8 and 9. There's a little bit of a, um, um, it's not really a, it's like he, he kind of said, he dealt with what he dealt with in the first seven chapters. And he kind of gets to chapter 8 and goes, well, now I need to deal with this. And then, and then chapter, starting in chapter 10, he begins to deal with his authority of his ministry. Uh, there's an issue here that there's a, a collection going on for the saints in the church. And Paul is writing back to the church at Corinth saying, and I'm going to kind of synopsis a little bit. You know, look, you guys a year ago planned on doing this. You made a, you made a promise to do this. Now I'm writing to you at this point in time to say, uh, let's make sure we're doing what we, what we committed to do. Um, not that you're not going to do it, but I just want to make sure that you hadn't forgotten or, you know, you might kind of maybe gotten a, a little upset. Maybe he's kind of thinking because they got upset with him, they're going to, uh, they're going to um, uh, renege on their word. And not keep the word, so he's just trying to make sure that he is, um, he's on the same, they're on the same page and they're not kind of wavering in their position. So let's pick up uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, verse 1, I'm sorry, I kind of went chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, I kind of just kind of ran out all this one word, didn't I? It was a new word, the one moreover word. Okay, chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do uh, you to wit or know. The word wit's old English for to know or to know. So we, we do you to know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now, he's over in Macedonia, okay? And um, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abound unto the riches of their liberality. Now, uh, liberality, you know, here he is. They're saying they're, they're in a tight, tough place. Everybody say they're in a tight, tough place. All right. Church of Macedonia. The churches of Macedonia are, are, are struggling financially. Okay? Yet Paul said, how that in a great trial of affliction and abundance of their joy, and see, they're still full of joy. You don't have to, you can't, you don't have to lose your joy just because you're in a tight place. As a matter of fact, Jerry Savelle used to preach, if the devil can't steal your joy, he can't keep your goods. 
<clears throat> Amen. Brother Roberts came up to him after one time, he was preaching it, and said, uh, see that, Jerry? He has written notes in his Bible. He said, yes, sir. Brother Roberts, he said, look, what does that say at the top? He said, Oral's joy. He said, this is my sermon now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Now, see, now Jerry had preached Brother Roberts' sermon uh, for a lot, back in the 80s a lot, the fourth man in the fiery furnace. Now, if you ever, the original servant, Brother, Brother Roberts, used to preach that in his old tent meetings, the fourth man in the fiery furnace. And uh, Brother Jerry picked that up and started, who is this fourth man? You know, it's a, it's a good sermon. It'll, it'll preach. It'll preach today, and even if somebody else got the notes, he'll still preach. I just need to get him and preach because it's a, it's a preaching sermon. It's a good one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, but for, to their power, I bear record, yea, beyond the power. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, for the abundance, their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, now he's saying for their ability, okay, I bear record, yea, beyond their power or their ability, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. In other words, they came with a gift. You know, and I, I would have to think, Paul would have thought, man, they're in a mess. And said, look, you guys don't need to do this. And they, but they, they begged him. They entreated him. They wanted to give this. Okay? Um, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry of the, to the saints. And this they did not as we hoped. Now, let me say this. This wasn't a negative not as we hoped. It was a beyond what they hoped. Okay? But first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. And his, so here's what happened. They, Paul kind of thought one thing was going to happen, and they went beyond that. All right? And they not only did they give a gift that was, you know, not, they, they gave themselves first to the Lord. In other words, you know, we're committing to the Lord. They're having the right heart before the Lord, the right attitudes before the Lord. And even in all that, even in their deep poverty, keeping their joy, they're bringing this gift for the ministry of the saints or ministry to the saints. Uh, and this they did not as we hoped. Beyond, beyond, really, but first gave, up, gave their own selves to the Lord and, and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace. The word grace here means gift. Okay? Now, see, grace can mean gift. We, we have a lot of definitions for grace. The standard pat definition we use most of the time is favor or divine favor or, um, as many people, unmerited favor. Well, if you take that definition and stick it everywhere you, you see the word grace, you're going to find that it don't fit. There's just places it just doesn't fit. So then the word charis, gift, has to have, you know, um, uh, I was reading um, my friend Guy Dunnick. Um, if guys, we went to Raymond together. We were back to Raymond back in 81 together. And, and, and guy, Guy's been to our church a number of years ago. And uh, really, but his, his teaching on grace, his understanding of grace is uh, honestly one of the best you'll find out there anywhere. And what he, he did, he said, you know, just like, Jesus took the word agape and elevated it to mean, it did not mean the God kind of love when Jesus used it. But he elevated the meaning of it. He took it and coined that and made it into that. For God so loved the world, okay? He elevated the meaning of that word. So when we study it in New Testament Greek, it's no longer the, the, the Septuagint, not even the Septuagint, but the classical Greek definition. It has moved into a higher meaning in New Testament usage, the meaning the unconditional, the God kind of love. So the word grace uh, or charis in the, great, in the Greek means a gift. But Paul used it in so many different ways. We have to understand it can mean, it can mean a gift. It can mean uh, strength. It can mean empowerment. It can mean sustain, to sustain. It can mean favor. Okay? But it's not limited to favor. Okay? So if you just kind of go and say it's unmerited favor, and, and, and certain scriptures you put that, you can, you, you'll read that and go, that don't make any sense that way. You know, Paul said that my, that Jesus told him in the, in the middle of the thorn of the flesh that my grace is sufficient for your unmerited favor in the midst of being attacked. How is unmerited favor? No, it means strength, my strengthening grace. Because what did Paul say? He said, when I'm weak, then am I strong. So it had to mean it was, there was a grace of strength that would come on him in the midst of a battle. All right? Here it, it's referring to money. It's a gift. It's talking about money. It's not talking about favor. It's talking about money. And this whole chapter 8 and 9 are talking about an offering, money. That, you know, he was finishing you the same grace or gift also. In other words, the money they were taking up in Macedonia, they had committed over in Achaia or in, in the Corneth, in the region of Achaia. They had committed to give, uh, and, and actually Paul goes on down here and says, a year earlier. And, and so they, they, and we desired that Titus, 
that as he had begun, so he would also finish it in you. In other words, Paul's kind of hinting here, and we find out later here, uh, he's going to be send Titus back over to make sure they're doing what they said they would do. All right? <clears throat> Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see or make sure you abound in this grace or gift also. Now, just don't walk around and say, I got faith, I got love, I got knowledge. Make sure you keep your word. Amen? I speak, by com I speak not by commandment. Now, Paul's not ordering them to do this. But by occasion of the forwardness, or the word forward throughout this passage, the word forward, I don't know why they use that, you know, I may, may, maybe it meant at that time. You understand languages evolve? How many know the word charity don't mean what it meant when they translated the Bible? Now it means just throw some money out there. And, you know, in, in, at the time, they used it to translate agape. It was a sacrificial gift to someone um, with no, no, record, no strings attached. Okay? Now, now it's, it's been watered down so much, it doesn't convey nearly what they were trying to say when they wrote the King James. All right? Because uh, it translates agape. The God kind of love. We know that charity, when you say the word charity, that you don't get God kind of love out of that. Unless you really think, kind of go, well, what were they trying to say 400 years ago? But right now, you, don't, you just don't kind of get that. All right? So throughout this passage, forward, forwardness is talking about being willing or, or having a willingness. So let's we'll say it that way. By, but by the occasion of the willingness of others and, and to prove the sincerity of your love. In other words, others are doing this. Okay, we got churches over here in Macedonia. As a matter of fact, some of these churches are so bad off that we, you know, we didn't even want to take their gift. But, you know, they, they entreated us to take their gift. All right? Um, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Everybody talks about how poor Jesus was. The reason Jesus became poor is so we could become rich. We need to be, you know, I need to be like Jesus and be poor. No, he, he, he became poor so you could be rich. We get it messed up sometimes. Thank you for your enthusiasm. This is a Wednesday night. I know you worked all day, but be enthusiastic for Jesus. I mean, I'm going to get Karen some pom-poms. So She's going to do the cheerleading stuff. Huh? Woo, Karen the cheerleader. All right. Cheerleader for Jesus. And herein I give my advice. Now, Paul, again, remember he said, I'm not doing this by commandment. But because everybody else is willing, I'm basically, you know, hey, guys, step up to the plate. He's basically saying in a kind way, step up to the plate and fulfill your obligation. Okay? Without, without demeaning them and putting them down and saying, you're going to burn in hell if you don't. He wasn't, you know. Uh, herein I give my advice. For this is expedient. It's expedient for you. What, does it, what would something be expedient for me? What would that mean? It's profitable. It's good for me. Now, Paul said, I'm going to give my advice because it's good for you. It'll, it'll, it will be for your benefit, okay? Who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward or willing a year ago. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. Kind of they started, must have kind of got sidetracked a little bit. Dates coming up on the commitment. They're, they don't look like they're really going to make it, but Paul is encouraging them to see it through, okay? Now, don't just be willing a year ago. Make sure you do what you said you were going to do. Hello. That there was a, um, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also of that which you have. In other words, you were willing, but let's make sure you do it. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath. And not according to that, he hath not. Now, now here, Paul is bringing some balance. You'll have people tell you, just go broke. Oh, it's pastor, listen, it's pastor appreciation day. Well, you don't need to go in debt to bless the pastor. Well, you need to give up. No, you need to follow the Lord. Now, do I get blessed if you bless me? Yes. But it's not a blessing to me if, you're, if you can't eat for three weeks after you bless me. 
That's not, that's not my heart. I don't want you going without food so I, I could get a new something. That's not my heart. Hello? That's not, the way we do, that's not the way it should be done in the church. And Paul makes that clear. He says that the willingness is accepted according to what you have and not according to what you don't have. For I mean not that others men be eased and you be burdened. Hello? That's what Paul said. We're not talking about you getting in trouble financially to make sure that somebody else gets ministered to. God is God. Amen? God is able. God has, God has enough people around to get the stuff to them that need to get to them. You don't have to go bankrupt. But you know, well, I, if I don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. Now, wait a second now. That's called the Elijah syndrome. How do you know? I just called it that. Remember Elijah? I, only I, have not, you know, bowed my knee to Baal. And God said what? Get up, go do this, for I have reserved unto myself 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. So if you're the only one that can get it done, then you're suffering with the Elijah syndrome. No, you're not the only one that can get it done. So Paul, Paul's trying to make it clear. Now, I want you to keep up and do what you said you're going to do, <clears throat> but don't do it in a way that is to your personal detriment. Pastor Ed, I can't believe you're preaching that. Most preachers tell you to give up, make sure the preacher's taking care of stuff, all the money in the pocket, and it's all going to be, you know, and they're going to be blessed in doing it. Can I say something? If it's not a faith, it's a sin. And if you're doing it to look like something or to impress somebody, if your motive is not because you have it in your heart, that's what you're supposed to do. By God. I understand this. We, even Paul, here's, even this, if it's in your heart to do something and it's not there, then it may not be the time to do this for you. It might be later. God bringing you to that place where you can do that at another time. But if there's no, if, you know, don't go get your credit card out and give $25,000 to the church and now you're going, you can't even pay your bills. Because you went in a sermon and somebody thought you were going to get a hundredfold return tonight before you walk out the front door? Because n- number one, the church can't give you your money back. It's illegal. Did you know that? I mean, I've had people write me letters. Say, I gave so much money. To, I gave, one lady years ago wrote a letter and said, uh, I gave $900 to the church while I was there and I want it back. Uh, lady, I'm sorry. But IRS regulations state that we cannot, once it's been deposited and given, we can't give that money back to you because there's too much. There's, and the reason why that was fraud, people were giving money and they were getting money back somehow. But yet they were counting that off their taxes. Uh, and so the IRS passed a rule, you can't give it back. So, well, I don't want to go to jail giving you your money back. Okay. But don't you know, if you give $25,000 for the, you know, and, and you can't even pay your bills, then you're not doing it. Paul said, and I'm, I, that it, it, your willingness should be according to what you have and not according to what you don't have. Now, if the Lord speaks to you, see, here's every, this is, a, this is a principle, but God may speak to you and say, commit to this and I'm going to provide. That's different. Okay? But it has to be God, not the manipulation. Now, we, we've, we've said some things about the church, about our needs. We just stay in the need. If you can give to it, fine. If you can't, you, you shouldn't feel guilty. If you gave $5 and that's all you had to give, give what you have. Jesus said the woman who gave two, two pennies gave more than everybody else put together because she gave all she had. She gave out of her heart. She couldn't give what she didn't have. Now, can't, now today you can. You got credit cards. You can give what you don't have. We, we, we take those things now as a convenience, not so you can get in trouble, all right? Um, for I mean not that other men be eased and you be burdened. Now, think about this. Oh, we need, you know, our, our traveling ministry needs this money, 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 and we give all this money out to them, and then we can't even pay our bills. And it's not right to ease their burden and we uh, meet their, or they be ease, and then we can't do anything. So there's a balance that comes in here. And here Paul, that's what Paul says here. But by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, and their abundance also may be a supply to your want, that there may be equality. We're not talking about socialism here. 
See, we're not talking about socialism. What are we talking about? Talking about that, you know, maybe right now you're, everything's good for you or good for your ministry or good for your church or good for what you're going through. And, and in the midst of a difficult time, you can help those who are going through a tough time. And then in the future, it could be you're in a difficult time, but they're walking in abundance and they can help you. There's an, it's an equality, not in the sense of socialism, utopia, where everybody is exactly the same. Because if everybody had the same, there would never be an abundance and a lack. It would mean that at the time that there's a need and there's a necessity, we can minister to that based on where we are. Okay? We had times we've just done all kinds of stuff. We've given all kinds of money to all kinds of ministries. That were, that were, I remember one time um, uh, Joe Morris was here. Joe Morris came in, and he had to pay two of his mates. You know, uh, like American Express, you've got to pay them at, you know, right then. You don't get to carry them over. The, most, the ones that he had. And there, they had two different types now, but back then, most of the time, it was air pay in a month. He had two major bills due, plus to buy an airline ticket to go to Russia. And he had just come from two small churches in Texas, and he, didn't, he, he lost money going. But he went because God said go. You go where God says go. You don't go because there's going to be enough money there to pay your, your American Express bill. All right? Well, one of the nights, uh, he was here for, for Sunday morning night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. One of the services, he, he, the Lord spoke to him and said, take up an offering for, for Pastor Ed and the church, or, you know, instead of taking it for you. And, and they did. And we received offerings during the week. And we said, well, you know, Joe has, has a need. We want to minister to him, so let's just give him a you know, blessing. Well, you know, we got the offerings counted up, and it was not what he needed. I mean, it's like, you know, this is the last church he's at before the bills all do, and the airline tickets got to be bought, and it wasn't enough to do it. So, you know, we counted the offering and everything, and, and um, next day I got ready to make the deposit before I went and took it to the airport and noticed that I had miscalculated a check. There was a check in there for $100 that I thought, and actually it was for 1000 We were $900 off. That's a lot of money. Okay? So I pick him up at the airport, and I hand him the envelope with the check in and say, Brother Joe, I am so bar I'm sorry, brother. I, I made a mistake last night when I was adding the checks, and, and one of them was off. Um, so, he, Ed, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm trusting God because I already kind of told him what it was, you know, uh, what we thought it was. And, you know, he, oh, it's okay. It's okay. But, Joe, I feel so bad, brother. He just, it's all right. I said, well, actually, it wasn't for, you know, uh, I think it was like $2,600. I said, it was, it was 3500 <laughs> I had an I, Strung him out. Hallelujah. Well, that paid the both American Express bills, bought his airline ticket to rush, and we had received an extra offer for the church in the middle of all that. We had 80 people in the meetings. Hallelujah. See, we walk in a place of abundance. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. And so he came out of churches that didn't have any abundance, but ministered according to what God said go do there. Came here, and you look at our crowd, and you're going, well, I'm, 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 I really need some money, and he walks out. And at the end of everything, everything paid for. See? So there'll be times where there's abundance and there's lack. For what, what reason? Well, the devil attacks for one thing. Amen. Not, well, not so be it, but that's the truth. Okay? Say, ah, stop and think about it for a minute. The devil does attack. Hallelujah. Not that he attacks, but we use hallelujah as an expression. Well, praise God. Not that he attacks, but we're victorious in it. Amen? Hallelujah. So, he goes on and says, verse 15, As it is written, he that has gathered much had nothing over, he that had gathered little had no lack. What's he trying to say? Paul's, now again, Paul's not um, endorsing socialism. All right? But the body of Christ should take care of the body of Christ. Amen. But thanks be to God, which puts the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward or willing of his own record, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother, whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only, uh, not that only, but who also is chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace or this gift. In other words, they got a team running around. He might, he, I don't know, this guy could have been an enforcer. They're running around with money. Maybe, maybe he's, uh, you know, Schwarzenegger or something. You know? 
who administer by us the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind, avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest, thing, for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. They're, they're trying to be upright and make sure that it's handled properly. We, sent, well, we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent <coughs> in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, in other words, now look, if they, why are we giving this man all this money? And you're going to have somebody ask those questions. Hello? And so, what did he say? He said, Titus is coming over there, and if anybody asks about him, you tell him, he's my partner and fellow helper concerning you. Or if they ask about our brother, be inquired of, they are messengers of the church and the glory of Christ. Wherefore, show unto them and before the churches the proof of your love and, on our, and of our behalf, a boasting of you on your behalf. So in other words, you can trust. He's basically saying, giving them recommendation, you can trust the guys that we sent. That's what he's saying. And if anybody steps up and goes, well, uh, who is this guy we're giving the money to? You tell him he's my fellow helper, that I sent him. And the guy with him, he works for us. Okay. Verse, chapter 9, verse 1, which, oh, yeah, praise God. For as touching the ministry to the saints, it is superfluous or not really needful for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness, again, willingness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia, that is over in Cornetharium, was ready a year ago. And you see, Paul got to, got to boast of them then thought, about I better make sure they're doing the right thing. I told him, I'm, I'm going around telling everybody, you ready a year ago. But I'm going to send Titus to make sure you are ready. Um, in your zeal has provoked very many. By him saying that, others got excited and started, you know, well, praise God, we're going to be ready too. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest happily, if they have Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say, not ye, should be ashamed of this same confident boasting. In other words, we would look really bad if we brag about you all over the place and everybody else is getting in on this deal and we show up and you ain't got nothing. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, that is, your blessing, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of blessing and not of covetousness. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man as he purposes in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God make love with a cheerful giver. Now, the very next verse says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have an all sufficiency, and all things may abound to every good work. Okay. But notice Paul said here before he says that, See, people take that verse out and run up. God's making, able to make all sufficiency abound to me in every good work, but they forget the part about purposing in your heart and how, and how you're sowing, the attitude by which you sow. So if you sow sparingly, now Paul says purpose in your heart and how you sow has how you receive. If it's sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. There's a principle here. It's not that your sparing seed's a bad seed. It's just going to produce according to what you, how you sowed it. Hello? It's not, that, it's not a slam that, you know, if I gave sparingly, I'm going to reap sparingly. No, it's a principle. If I plant five collard seeds, I'm going to get five collard plants. If I plant 500 collard seeds, I'm going to get 500 collard plants. If I sow sparingly, I will reap sparingly. If I sow bountifully, I'm going to reap bountifully every man according as he purposes in his own heart. What? Not grudgingly. Why? Because if you get into grudgingly, you get out of faith. If you're sitting in a meeting and you feel the pressure to give money you don't have, hello, don't give it. Why? Because you're out of faith. You're giving grudgingly. Don't give out of necessity. I got to give this to get out of trouble. No. Everything we do should be a matter of faith. We should give out of faith, not out of grudgingness. Grud being gr grudgingness. Is that a word? It is now. I just made it up, all right? I took a word that didn't exist. I'm a neologian. Hallelujah. What's that? He who makes up new words. All right. Uh, not, not in a grudging manner or a begrudging manner 
or of necessity. See, some people will give, well, I got to give to get myself out of trouble. Well, you know, listen, folks. That's, that's, don't get, in other words, don't give out of desperation. Okay? How? For God loves a cheerful giver. Well, what does the Bible say? In everything, through prayer and supplication, let your request, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. What's that tell me? That tells, see, faith, the, the, the song of faith is a song of joy. It makes you cheerful. Everybody say cheerful. So if you're giving out of faith, you're going to be giving out of joy. You're giving grudgingly, you're going to be ticked off. Walk out of there mad. Well, I gave, I'll tell you one thing. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I sat there and I, know, and I felt the pressure to get, so I just gave him to shut up. There's your reward. What? I'm spending 100 fold. You ain't going to get it. Why not? Because you gave to get him to shut up. And he shut up. You got your reward. You can't. So give as a matter of faith, not begrudgingly or not in desperation, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, see this goes on. He's dispersed abroad. He's given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. He that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now, so what he says here is <clears throat> God is the one who empowers you to get the seed in the first place. And there's two, thing God, there's two things that God does. One, he gives seed to the sower. Two, he gives bread to the eater. Why? God's smart. If he doesn't sustain you while you're waiting for harvest, you'll eat your seed. Hello? Everybody would. They'll eat their seed rather than planting it. If, they, if, they, if I got a bunch of seed and they don't have any bread to eat, they will eat their seed instead of planting it. And they'll never get the harvest. So God gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Why? So you can get a harvest. And he's going to take care of you until harvest comes in. Then you can go out and get the harvest and have bread to eat. Amen? He increases the fruits of righteousness. Verse 11, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness or liberality, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of the service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but it abound, is abundant. Also, by many thanksgivings unto God. <clears throat> so Paul's saying here that what you're doing is going to cause people to rejoice in God. They're going to be thankful. There's going to be a lot of thanksgiving and praise to God. Amen. Everybody say hallelujah. While the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. So we have Paul here in an encouragement for them to maintain their, their position. They're going to do what they said they were going to do about giving. <clears throat> we, won't, we won't move into the next because the next one, he totally changes the subject. He changes course and goes on something else. Okay? So we're not going to we'll pick that up next week. Right before the, the Capel Taylor wedding. That's on Thursday, Wednesday night. Rehearsal's on Friday night. Wedding's on Friday afternoon. Honeymoon starts Saturday. Or Friday night, I guess. Hallelujah. So, anyway, that all being said, praise the Lord. Um, we're not going to pick up in chapter 10. But let, let, so here, <coughs> Paul is done. He's done the first seven chapters. He comes into chapter 8 and 9. He begins to talk about their, you know, he kind of somewhat shifts gears, but just, just, a, just a whatever to remind them to make sure they give. And there's, there's some principles we find out in this chap these chapters about giving about the attitude of giving, about the heart of giving, about the right way to give. And as your pastor, as much as we need as a lot of money to get caught up and get things, don't ever give because you feel the pressure to give. Amen. If we have to pack all stuff up and move it to a hotel, we'll just pack it up and move it to a hotel. That's not my will, not my design. It's not my plan. But, if that has, but don't you give.
and be in a tough place where you can't even make it. And you go, well, if you give to the Lord, he's going to make up for what Paul said. Don't give what you don't have. Let's follow the principles. Amen. I said, let's follow the principles. God's going to speak to somebody on the Internet. See, in faith, in the church, $100,000. And uh, we will take it straight to the bank. <laughs> Hallelujah. And deposit it. Hallelujah. Gu I guarantee you we will. Send you a thank you letter, too. With my I'll put my picture on it if that's what you want. Anyway, amen. But don't you give out of pressure. Hello? And, and, and quite frankly, some of the stuff that went on with the prosperity teaching over the past 15, 20 years, um, that's just some, a, 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 a lot. Not, not all of it, but a lot, was pressure. There was manipulation of people. And they, they were given what they didn't have. Hello. They were being burdened while they were easing the financial whatevers of ministries. And I think the thing that bothered me in all that more, as much as anything was a statement that some made, not everybody, but some made, might still be making it. You got to give up. You got to get to a higher anointing in order for the blessings to come back on you. And that's just not true. The Bible says give, and it didn't say give to the higher anointing. There's no Bible scripture that says give to the higher anointing. It said give. Amen. Paul, um, now when Paul said, my God, to meet your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, he's writing to the church at Philippi, and they sent money to him on his missionary trip because other churches weren't helping take care of him. And they got, they got back because they, they, listen, they weren't given to the higher anointing being taught that. They were just given because there was a need there. And to empower him to do what he was sent to do. Did not have anything to do with, can I be kind of real, real, real frank now? Preachers don't have to have million dollar houses to preach. Now, if they're all living in million dollar houses and the congregation is living in, in the projects, there's a problem. Hello. It ain't right. You're buying the, if you're buying the pastor, well, it's setting, he's setting an example before us. Let the word set an example before us. Let us grow. Come, let us let's grow together. And I can say about our church, we've grown over the years. I remember when we all pulled up in the parking lot, we weren't sure which cars were going to be able to make it out. Hello. We weren't sure if the highway patrol was going to come in there and tell them, don't put that back on the street. It's condemned. Not just not pass inspection, it's condemned. We've been in the parking lot trying to get people's cars started. They were so bad. Hello? We've actually pushed them across the parking lot and tried to get them to jump in the gear and kick, and kick in and start. Years ago. But let me say this. Pastor Ed wasn't driving up in a, in a uh, 780, 735i Beamer, 785, whatever they are. Beamer. Right off the show floor. While they were, while they were driving off of something they, could, they couldn't even get the church in. That's, that'll set vision for them. How about let the word set vision for them? Amen. Well, You've got to wear hand-tailored suits to church pastor to set a vision for the people. Really? My best isn't good enough? This, that's, that's, all that stuff was manipulation stuff. Under the guise you were setting vision in front of the people. Let the word create vision in the people. Now, we're going to walk by faith and do right. I mean, you know, as the pastor, went, but I'm not doing it under the guise that if I am super blessed, you're going to want to be super blessed like me. Half the time, they get jealous and get offended and leave. You've done damage instead of helping. That went over big. <coughs> I mean, I've heard of pastor appreciation day, appreciation days, even here in this city. Where they drive a $35,000 Beamer up and give it to the pastor on, on Pastor Appreciation Day. And uh, people have got no money. Well, I believe in blessing the man of God. I believe in helping him. I believe you should. You should take care of your pastor. That, that's just right. It's a biblical principle. 
Well, let's not do it so that, we're e that he's ease and you're burdened. Ministers who send letters, don't make it so they're ease and you're burdened. Let's follow a biblical principle. Let's give out of what we have. Amen. Let's help people. Let's do the right things. Let's make sure that as pastors blessed, you're not, you're not cursed and ticked off about it. Well, Pastor, I got that new couch last year, and daggum, and I'll tell you what, I wish I had one. It ain't right that he's got one. I, well, see, now we've got a problem. What was supposed to be for a blessing has become a curse because bitterness has entered in. Amen. That's why we can't, we can't pressure. Let's teach the word. Let people respond to the word, and if and, and not a manipulated word, let them respond out of heart. Again, see, have you ever? Do I pressure you? Have you ever been pressured? Have you ever watched a television show, or you've been in a meeting somewhere, and you kind of felt the pressure to do something that you really weren't prepared to do? I've been in meetings with a bunch of ministers, and they're all sitting there, and all of a sudden, because one person gets up and went and put money in the preacher's pocket, everybody starts feeling the pressure. They all say they're responding in faith. No, they're not. How do you know? Because I'm sitting there going, well, I really don't feel led to do that. But everybody around you is doing it. What's happening? You're, you're, there's a pressure to go do something you're not in faith about. Don't do it. Well, there's something wrong with their heart. Then let the Lord deal with them through the Spirit by the word, to put faith in them so that when they do do something along those lines, it's out of faith and not out of pressure. And you haven't manipulated them into it. You haven't been manipulated into doing it. And so if you're not in faith, just don't do it. Hello? Well, I'll tell you what, the Lord told me to do such and such, 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 and he doubled all my income next week. And people start doing exactly what he did. Did you hear what he said? The Lord told me. If the Lord don't tell you, if the speaker tells you, hello, faith don't, doesn't come by hearing and hearing by what the speaker said. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. It has to be faith. Now, somebody right beside you could do exactly what I said. Get up and go put money in a preacher's pocket or whatever. Old, old days, we didn't do that. We call, we call them, and, and I like the old days better. You know why? Because old Pentecostal handshakes did not get anybody else to do something because they did it. God put it in their heart. They walked by the pastor, the preacher, shook his hand, and when he pulled your hand back, there was money in it. They, we always call, call it a Pentecostal handshake. Now, I don't know if the Baptists do it or not, but that's what the Pentecostals, we all, you know, maybe, maybe if you're a Baptist, you call it the Baptist handshake. I don't know. Or a Lutheran handshake. But I grew up Pentecostal, so we call it the Pentecostal handshake. All right? And you know what? Nobody knew about it but you and them. Does that make sense? It didn't get other people to act because you acted. The ones that acted did it because they wanted to do it in their heart that was between them and God. I believe there was more power and more faith involved in there than just copying what everybody else was doing. Amen. So the Lord tells you to bless me. You can walk by and shake my hand. I won't feel, wow, my God, what is this? Look at here. Amen. Y'all blessed? We love you. I'm going to tell you, we, we want you to be blessed according to the word. We want you to be blessed according to faith. We want you to be blessed by what the Spirit of God tells us to do through his word. We do not want you manipulated in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Everybody say amen. We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button thank you and may god richly bless you for your giving